stay safe out there. I'm your host Yusuf and these are the top 10 times people have gone missing and never been found. Make sure to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Anyways, let's get searching. Number 10, Teddy Wang. Teddy Wang was born in Shanghai, China to Wenzhenese parents, the son of paint and chemical business proprietor Wang Dinshin. He was a childhood playmate of Kung Yu Sam, and in 1948, when she was 11 and him being 15, they renewed their friendship, and they married in 1955. The Wangs moved to Hong Kong, and the business became the China Chem Group, eventually becoming one of the territory's largest and most powerful companies due to its lucrative pharmaceutical division. Wang was abducted on the 12th of April 1983, when his Mercedes-Benz was hijacked. He was taken away and chained to a bed for eight days until Nina Wang paid a ransom of 33 million Hong Kong dollars. I feel like Hong Kong dollars is not the word for it. Until Nina Wang paid a ransom of 33 million dollars. Wang was kidnapped again on the 10th of April 1990 as he left the jockey club in Hong Kong. His abductors demanded 60 million dollars this time. His wife Nina paid an installment of 34 million, but Wang was not returned. Several of the alleged kidnappers were caught and said that the 56 year old Wang had been thrown into the sea from a sampan on the 13th of April. If you don't know what a sampan is, it's a kind of boat. His body was never found and he was declared legally removed in 1999. Number 9, Annie McCarrick. McCarrick was born on Long Island, New York, and she lived there until her move to Ireland in January 1987. McCarrick disappeared on March 26, 1993. She had left her apartment in Dublin, Ireland, so that she could go to the Wicklow Mountains for the day. She had asked a friend to accompany her, but her friend declined. CCTV captured images of McCarrick in the Allied Irish Bank location in Sandy Mount, where she was seen withdrawing money from her bank account. She did some shopping at Quinsworth Supermarket before returning to her apartment at 3 p.m. She was seen on a bus at around 3.40 p.m. in Ranelagh heading toward Enniscary. Sometime later that evening, between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., the doorman at Johnny Fox's pub in Glencullen claims to have seen McCarrick at the pub, accompanied by a young man who was wearing a wax jacket. Investigators believe the man looks something like this and issued this photo fit at the time. Allegedly, McCarrick had gone to see an Irish music and dancing show that was a traditional event called the Hooli Show, but did not realize that there was a cover charge. McCarrick's male friend then paid for her and accompanied her in to watch the show. Nobody saw either McCarrick or her male friend leave the pub and the man's identity has never been discovered. Number 8, Aaron Mary Gilbert. On July 1st, 1995, Gilbert accompanied David Combs, a man whom she had met several days prior at a bar called Chilkoot Charlie's in Anchorage, to the Girdwood Forest Fair in Girdwood, Alaska, a village south of Anchorage. The two left Anchorage at approximately 4 p.m. Gilbert was last seen at the fair's beer garden with Combs before they left at approximately 6 p.m. At the time, she was wearing a black leather jacket, a black and white shirt, mountain boots, and black jeans. By Combs' account, he and Gilbert returned to his car, but found the battery not working, as he had left the headlights on. He claimed he told Gilbert he was going to a nearby friend's home to get help, and walked for around two hours, but was unable to locate his friend's residence. When he returned, Gilbert was no longer in the car. According to Combs, he assumed Gilbert had returned to the fair, and found that he was able to start the car engine. He then returned to the fairground and searched for Gilbert unsuccessfully until approximately 1 in the morning. Number 7, Amy Bechtel. On the morning of July 24th, 1997, Bechtel told her husband Steve that she was planning on running several errands in town after teaching a children's weightlifting class at the Wind River Fitness Center. She stopped at Camera Connection, a photo store near her home in Lander, around 2.30 p.m. after teaching her class. Following her time at the photo store, she stopped by Gallery 331, where she spoke to the proprietor, Greg Wagner. Wagner noted that Bechtel seemed hurried, and repeatedly glanced at her watch during their conversation. Wagner's was the last confirmed sighting of Bechtel. After leaving the photo shop, it is believed by authorities that Bechtel drove to the Shoshone National Forest to practice the course of an upcoming 10k run she was enrolled to compete in. According to an eyewitness driving on Loop Road through the forest that afternoon, a woman resembling Bechtel was seen running along the road wearing black shorts similar to those she had worn earlier that day. At 4.30pm, Steve returned home after having spent the day with a friend and found his wife absent. At 10.30pm, he called the police to report his wife missing. 
At one in the morning, on the morning of July 25th, Bechtel's car, a white Toyota Tercel, was discovered parked on a turnout at Burnt Gulch in Lander. Number six, Suzanne Lyle. On the night of March 2nd, 1998, Suzanne Lyle, an undergraduate at the State University of New York at Albany, left her job at the Babbage's in Crossgates Mall in the nearby suburb of Westmere after the store had closed. She is believed to have taken a city bus from the mall back to the university's uptown campus, where a classmate has said she saw Lyle get off the bus at Collin Circle, a short walk from her dorm. She has never been seen again. The next morning, Lyle was reported missing. That afternoon, her credit card was used at a nearby convenience store's ATM to withdraw $20. According to her boyfriend, only she and he knew the pin. He had a verified alibi for the time of her disappearance, but due to his later refusal to cooperate with the police, they have been unable to completely rule him out as a suspect. A man who used the ATM around the same time has also been ruled out. New York State Police continue to investigate the case. Number five, Gilbert Winter. Winter worked as an enforcer for the Adams Family Crime Syndicate. In 1994, allegedly with assistance from fellow enforcer and future crime boss Ray Barton, he executed substance dealer Claude Mosley with a samurai sword as punishment for pocketing profits from a substance operation run by the Adams Family. He went on trial for the slaughter, but key witnesses refused to give evidence against him, one preferring to go to jail for contempt of court, and the case was dropped. On the 9th of March 1998, Winter left the house he shared with his girlfriend driving off in her Nissan Micra. Later that day, he spoke to her by phone but did not disclose his location. Winter was never seen again, and the car was subsequently discovered abandoned in June. His bank account, credit card, and mobile phone have not been used since then. There are two main theories for the disappearance, both hinging on a leafy substance deal where 800,000 British pounds went missing. Either Winter double-crossed the Adams family, stole the money, and was removed accordingly in retribution, allegedly being buried somewhere in the foundations of the Millennium Dome, or fled to the Caribbean with the money and remained in hiding. Regardless, he was never found. Number four, Maura Murray. Murray, a nursing student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, was last seen on New Hampshire Route 112 at the scene of a minor one-vehicle accident, in which her car was disabled after crashing into a roadside snowbank. Earlier on, the day of her disappearance, she had lied to professors about a passing in her family, stating that she would be absent from class for a week. A school bus driver who happened upon Murray's crash site stopped to ask if she needed help, and Murray declined. Upon returning home a short time later, the bus driver called police anyway, but by the time first responders arrived, 10 minutes later, Murray had vanished. Her keys, along with bank and credit cards, have never been located, despite extensive searches of her abandoned car and the neighboring wooded areas. Number three, Ray Gracar. At 11.30 in the morning on April 15th, 2005, Gracar called for Nicola to inform her that he was driving through the Brush Valley area northeast of Center Hall. Gracar failed to return home and late that evening, for Nicola reported him missing. The following day, investigators identified Gracar's red Mini Cooper in the parking lot of an antique store in Lewisburg. The car contained his county-issued cell phone, but not his laptop, computer, keys, or wallet. Investigators identified no signs of foul play. Police and family members noted that the location of the vehicle, adjacent to two bridges over the Susquehanna River, bore some similarities to the location of the vehicle of Gricar's older brother Roy when he decided to take his own life in 1996. In the days following the discovery of Gricar's vehicle, authorities searched the river and its banks but found no sign of him. Police also noted that a sniffer dog's behavior around where Gricar's car was found suggested that he might have gotten into another vehicle with someone else. Pennsylvania authorities asked the FBI to analyze Gricar's bank accounts, credit card records, and cell phone records, but found no clues as to where he might have been. On July 30th, fishermen discovered Gricar's county-issued laptop in the Susquehanna River beneath a bridge between Lewisburg and Milton, but its hard drive was missing. Divers searched the area of the river near where it was found over the next several days, but found nothing else. Two months later, someone discovered a hard drive on the banks of the Susquehanna River about 100 yards, or 91 meters, from the location of the laptop, and investigators hypothesized that it had come from his computer. However, it was badly damaged in analysis by the FBI and the US Secret Service, and the data recovery firm Kroll OnTrack failed to recover anything from it. Number two, Robert Levinson. 
Levinson was a retired US DEA and FBI agent. He was last seen in the custody of who seemed to be Iranian intelligence agents on the 9th of March 2007 on Kish Island. He had gone there to set up a meeting with Dawood Salahuddin, an American-born convert to Islam, ostensibly about securing the Iranian government's help in controlling the distribution of pirated American cigarettes in Iran. He was later revealed to be working for the CIA at that time as well. In 2010, a video of him somewhat emaciated was released. I have been held here for three and a half years. I am not in very good health. I am running very quickly out of diabetes medicine. In which he begs for help from the US government to be released. The US government has regularly raised the issue of his release with Iran as part of talks between the countries. But Iran's statement as to whether he still is in their custody or even alive have been contradictory. And Levinson is thought to be no longer under their control if he is still alive. His family announced on the 25th of March 2020 that he is presumed to have passed away. Number 1. Jamie Fraley In the early hours of April 8, 2008, Jamie Fraley of Gastonia, North Carolina, United States, told a friend over the phone that she was going to the hospital for the third time in the last 24 hours due to a stomach flu. When asked who was taking her there, Fraley said it was another friend and declined to further identify that person. She has not been seen since. Her cell phone was found a few days later but provided no useful information as to her whereabouts. Investigators initially believed she had met with foul play and began focusing on Ricky Simon Sr., her fiance's father, who lived in the same apartment complex as a person of interest. He had driven Fraley to the hospital on one of her previous visits that day, and had a criminal record that included prison time for manslaughter after he had strangled a girlfriend in the 1980s. However, the investigation ended two months later when Simons was found passed away, apparently of heat stroke in the trunk of a former girlfriend's car. In 2015, a prison inmate confessed that he had terminated Fraley, but he was incarcerated at the time Fraley disappeared. Weird. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and comment if you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time on, say it with me now, Crime Time, baby.